Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this first online conference on out of hospital cardiac arrest registries on organized by an international out of hospital cardiac arrest registry group. Um, thank you very much for joining this session. Um, my name is Jan Venent. I'm an anesthesiologist and member of the steering committee of the German Resuscitation Registry. And I will be the moderator for our today's um, meeting. Before we are getting started, I will remember, remind you on some housekeeping rules. This session will be recorded and you will be put on mute um, during our conference. Please, if you have questions, place those questions in the Q&A chat box in your Zoom interface. And then secondly, I wanted to thank our, uh, the persons who have organized this conference. Um, I wanted to thank Sherman and Marielle, Ingwald and Choban for organizing uh, this session. We have up to um, this morning, our time soon, we had 641 registered participants. So we are very happy to have you all here. Um, secondly, or thirdly, I wanted to introduce the chairpersons of our meeting. First of all, it's Professor Karen Smith from Australia. She is the director of the Center for Research and Evaluation at Ambulance Victoria in Australia. She is an epidemiologist by training with an extensive experience in um, ambulance services and ambulance care. Furthermore, she's an adjunct professor at the School of Med uh, Public Health and Preventive Medicine at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Our second chairperson for today will be Professor Brian McNally. Professor McNally is an emergency medical, medical specialist at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia in the US. He knows the EMS quite well because he starts his medical career as an EMT in um, the New York City EMS. And furthermore, Professor McNally is the executive director of the cardiac arrest registry to enhance survival in the US. The third um, chairperson of this session today will be Professor Marcus Ong from Singapore. Professor Ong is a senior consultant and the director of research and the clinical scientist at the Department of Emergency Medicine in the Singapore General Hospital. He's the professor and director of health service system research at Duke's NAS Medical School in Singapore. And he also serves as the medical director at the unit for pre-hospital emergency care in Singapore. And finally, he's the chairman of the Pan-Asian Resuscitation Outcome Studies. And our fourth um, chairperson for the today's session is Professor Jan Thorsten Gresner from Germany. Jan Thorsten Gresner is the director of the Institute for Emergency Medicine at University Hospital in Schleswig-Holstein, um, Kiel University. He is also the chairperson of the German Resuscitation Registry and one of the masterminds behind the European Registry of Cardiac Arrest Studies. Um, by ERC in, um, in Europe. What we will do today is we will go through all the four continents and we will start with um, Australia. And I would like to invite um, Karen Smith now to introduce her team from Australia. Karen, the floor is yours. Oh, thanks very much. So I'm introducing uh, Dr. Jacasta Ball who is a senior research fellow with Ambulance Victoria and also heads up our Victorian Ambulance Cardiac Arrest Registry. And we start with Jocasta. Or I introduced Bridget as well. Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, and then we have um, Professor Bridget Dicker who heads up the research unit for St. John Ambulance in New Zealand, and also is heading up the cardiac arrest registry there. So 
So I'd like to thank the organisers for having me here today to present on the VACAR experience of communicating our data to engage the public and improve cardiac arrest outcomes. In 2018, as we know, the Global Resuscitation Alliance published their seminal report acting on the call to engage the world, world in improving survival rates from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. It was a call to action for all communities to implement best resuscitation practices and afford every person a decent chance to survive cardiac arrest. They suggested that communities can and must do better. better and that no one entity owns the cardiac resuscitation process and its outcomes and this of course was stated because there are multiple domains of accountability spread across multiple stakeholders in the pre-hospital cardiac resuscitation one of the key entities however is the public and they are critical in the processes of resuscitation at Ambulance Victoria, we give this public a seat at the table next to us to improve cardiac arrest survival. And in this presentation, I'm going to give you a few examples of the ways in which we have engaged the public um, using data from VACA to do this. So as an EMS system, we are, of course, accountable not only to governments and clinicians, but to the public. So at Ambulance Victoria, we communicate our progress and successes frequently in the public domain, and we celebrate survivors and support survivors, families and their carers. And by doing that in the public domain, we achieve buy-in from the public for our most important messages that we want to get out there. And in turn, the public become our advocates. And that, this includes uh, the cardiac arrest survivors as well. And the most notable cardiac arrest survival this year is the original Yellow Wiggle Greg Page, who is now a huge advocate of learning CPR and uh, in, in um, implementing AEDs in businesses and in public places and knowing the location of your closest AED. And he's also become an, a, an advocate for the Heart Foundation. So how do we communicate back our data to the public at AV? Well, we have a website where we publish our data and research publications for the public to access freely. And this, of course, includes our VACA annual report. A key for us at AV is our media department and our strategic communications and engagement team. These teams use consistent, simple and repeated messaging on key interventions to which the public can in, engage in to uh, improve cardiac arrest survival. We engage in the metropolitan and regional areas of Victoria, in the print media, digital media, broadcast media and social media. And that includes all usual channels of social media. And we've just started doing some live broadcasting on Facebook as well. So in our VACA annual report, we include a key survivor story every year, and that's right up the front of the report so that we're starting on a positive note and we provide context as to why we do what we do and an introduction to the statistics that are going to be presented. In the 2018-2019 VACA annual report, we included two survivor stories. The first was of a regional fuel depot worker whose manager saw him collapse and provided CPR until paramedics could arrive. This arrest prompted the fuel depot to install an AED at the site, and they also purchased AEDs for other depots in the region. And an overseas, our second story was about an overseas traveler who collapsed, collapsed while exercising in the gym of the building he was staying at. And it just so happened that a good SAM responder was located in the same building, was alerted to this patient's arrest and began resuscitation within a number of minutes. An AED was collected from the building's swimming pool area and the patient was shocked um, back from VT before, sorry, VF before the paramedics arrived. And we did a media launch for the VACA annual report with our then Minister for Health, Jenny McCarkos. 
Another key example of how we used our data to engage the public it was with our recent publication in resuscitation around the first wave of COVID-19 experienced in Victoria during March and May of this year. So the key findings of this work was that we didn't identify any differences in the incidence of OCA during the first wave of COVID-19 compared to three combined years of data. And this was very different from the narrative that we were hearing out of different countries of the world. We also didn't treat any COVID-19 positive arrests during that wave either. We saw that attempted resuscitation decreased by about 7%. And for those with an attempted resuscitation, there was no age or gender differential, but 50% less arrests were in public locations. There was decreased pad use. We identified that the median call to patient time and median at scene to at patient time was significantly longer, and that's due in part to the donning of PPE. We found that there was a median of two minutes delay to the first defibrillation during this time that resuscitation duration was seven minutes longer for those where ROSC was achieved and eight minutes shorter for those where no ROSC was achieved. We identified that survival decreased by an enormous 50% during this time. The same was seen for shockable rhythms. However, on logistic regression model, the odds of survival were still decreased by 50% despite adjustment for the non-influential factors of cardiac arrest survival and also for the delays that we identified in this work, which was a huge finding. For this work, we engaged the media with an exclusive article in the Age newspaper here in Melbourne with the, uh, the paper's uh, health reporter. And a lot of Twitter talk uh, was, uh, went around as well about this work. And then another key example of how we engage the public with uh, our data uh, in VACA is the current Shocktober and Restart a Heart Day, which was on the 16th of October. So given our work in the OCA space during COVID-19, this finding of a 50% reduction in survival was used to promote Shocktober and Restart a Heart Day. Shocktober is a month long campaign to highlight the importance of knowing CPR and where the closest AEDs are located. We also want to ensure that all AEDs are registered with AED on our register and we've got almost 7,000 AEDs registered on that register currently. We also want to make sure that AEDs are made publicly accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week if possible. And we also want to increase the registrations of Good Sam responders. This is the largest campaign that AV has ever launched, and it was launched on the 1st of October with the Minister for Health and Ambulance Services, the Honourable Martin Foley, and a survivor who was a 46 year old lady, very fit, whose 14 and 16 year old children revived her after founding her um, unconscious on the bathroom floor and in cardiac arrest. So during this campaign, there's been a lot of public engagement and it's been the largest public engagement project in the history of AV. So in addition to that 50% decline in survival seen in COVID-19, messaging from VACAR data is also being used such as the 75% arrests occur in private, private residences and that up to 70% increase in survival is seen when patients are shocked with a public AED. Um, AEV also um, conducted their first ever live CPR and AED class with 38,000 views to date of that class. And as of the 16th of October, which is uh, Restart a Heart Day, we've had 180 call push shock community education sessions booked in or conducted and messages have been spread by greater than 50 media outlets in the print, digital, TV and radio media. So there's, this is just an example of the huge amounts of media engagement that we've had, both in um, newspapers, on television, um, on all the major news channels, the major radio stations, on social media channels, and um, it topped off with a huge double page spread in the Herald Sun, uh, uh, highlighting that this 14 year old survivor um, 
was saved by CPR provided by teammates and his coach and an AED that was obtained from a, a close by location. So this just is a story about a man whose wife became an advocate for the public to learn CPR and to know where an AED is located and for businesses to um, register their AEDs with Ambulance Victoria. So therefore, I hope I've demonstrated to you that Ambulance Victoria has been very successful in using VACAR data to engage the public and seek um, their assistance to improve outcomes for cardiac arrest patients. And we will continue to do so um, into the future. Thank you very much for your time. I'd like to thank the organisers for Welcome and thank you all for zooming into this webinar. It's my privilege to be presenting on how can we better communicate registry data to mobilise public support to improve cardiac arrest outcomes. Today I'm going to talk about five ideas to mobilise public support. Less is more, make it simple, make it easy to access, use networking and make it engaging and fun. Let's talk about our first point. Less is more. Most registry data is large and can be analysed in multiple ways with multiple numbers of findings. Ambulance services, including my own, produce large annual reports with 20 pages or more of information to be digested by the public and related health sectors. For researchers, this is exciting and creates lots of possibilities for improvements. Large reports are great for those in the health sector, but are often too complex and contain too much information for the general public to digest and implement. It's a good idea to maybe put two or three findings where the public can make a difference to outcomes and create areas of focus or take home messages. Some examples of these are, the registry findings show that we have a low rate of public access to fibrillation. So our recommendations to the public would be, Know where the AEDs in your area are located. Another registry finding might be that we need more public trained in CPR. So our recommendations to go to the public would be to learn CPR and how to use an AED. In, in New Zealand, this can be done through a free Three Steps for Life course. And our third finding that we might want to communicate is that we need more Good SAM responders. Good SAM uh, are app-based responders that are triggered to go to cardiac arrests. And so our recommendations to the public could be to register and download the Good SAM responder app, and that anyone over 18 who knows how to perform CPR can join this app. Let's talk about our second point. Make it simple. Albert Einstein once said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Data could be presented in a table like this, where you can see in the first column, that this represents the year of analysis. The second is the total number of events, and the third is the proportion of events that had bystander CPR, and the fourth is the proportion of community responder AED use, and so on. Alternatively, the same data could be presented in an infographic format like this. The use of infographics makes the same data more readily understood by both the sector and the public. And you can see at a glance that only 4% of patients receive public access to fibrillation by a community responder prior to ambulance arrival. A combination of simple language and infographics also aids with the messaging. For example, the use of the words heart restarter are much easier to understand than AED or emergency defibrillator. Let's talk about our next point, make it easy to access. Registry findings and recommendations are frequently published in scientific journals and technical reports. These are often difficult to find online and scientific journal articles may not be open access or free to view. So 
Scientific articles and technical reports can also be long and written in language that can't easily be understood by the public. Using open access journals where possible to publish findings. There can be a number of advantages to this, but primarily this means that the public can access your findings. And make internal organisational reports freely available and downloadable to the public. However, as mentioned before, technical reports and scientific articles can be difficult to understand. So using social media such as Facebook, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, Yammer, YouTube can be good ways to convey messages to the public and can be very useful methods to mobilise change. Some examples of how social media can be used is the recent Restart a Heart Day campaign where Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and Instagram were all used extensively to convey messages to the public on what to do for someone in cardiac arrest. And the hashtag Cool push shop uses really simple language that most people can understand. Call for an ambulance, push on the chest, and shock to restart a heart. Which brings me to my next point using networking to mobilize change. Restart a heart day is a great example of using networking to mobilize change. World Restart a Heart Day involves all organizations that, that are involved in resuscitation across the world coming together to provide the same messages called Push Shop on the 16th of October every year. The involvement of so many organisations means that key messages are repeated and widely disseminated to help improve survival worldwide. The high level of engagement in this is highlighted by the number of organisations in the photos, tagged in the Twitter clip on the right and depicted in the logos at the bottom. These range from ambulance, fire, police, resuscitation councils, heart foundation, defence, surf life saving and health promotion agencies. As just described, networking can engage professionals across multiple sectors to come together to enact change. Importantly, networking is also used to engage with patients and communities to find out what matters to them as consumers. There are large health inequities across multiple areas, for example, according to ethnicity, sex and rurality. Networking is critical to enable and empower members of different communities, especially those with inequitable outcomes, so they can be supported to lead research and enact change from within their communities in a positive manner. And it's only through diverse and equal involvement in research that includes members of the communities being researched that findings and recommendations will be appropriate, meaningful and more likely to be implemented. This brings me to my last point, which is to make messaging fun and engaging. Some of the ways in which we can make messages fun and engaging is with comedy, celebrity advocates and with patient stories. One such celebrity, celebrity is Dr. Glaucoma Flecken, who is an ophthalmologist and comedian who survived a cardiac arrest thanks to the early recognition and CPR performed by his wife. They are now both using comedy through social media to advocate learning CPR. Another such celebrity is Greg Page. Greg Page is the original yellow wiggle and is a fortunate survivor of sudden cardiac arrest. Greg shared his patient story and is also now the founder of Heart of the Nation and an ambassador of Safe, Safe Beat for Life. So in summary, here's five ideas to help mobilize public support. Less is more, make it simple, make it easy to access, use networking and make it engaging and fun. Thank you. And you can find me on Twitter at Projectica. Thank you very much, um, Bridget, Jocasta, and Karen for this um, amazing talks and the information for, um, from Australia and New Zealand. And from the south of Australia and New Zealand, we are moving now to Europe, to the European Registry of Cardiac Arrest. And I give the floor um, to Jan Thorsten Greisner to introduce the speakers for Europe. Jan Thorsten, the floor is yours. 
Jan, thank you very much. And thank you very much uh, to the colleagues from New Zealand. So we call down under from the European side. Uh, perfect presentations and uh, we love it. So um, the next two speakers are very well known worldwide and also of course in Europe. And it's a really big pleasure for me that I'm allowed to uh, introduce two of the resuscitation giants from the European country. So Professor Johan Herlitz uh, is a professor of emergency care at the University of Boros in Sweden. He is the former chairman of the Swedish Registry of Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation. And he started very early in 1974 and is a specialized cardiologist. And um, if you read something about uh, resuscitation, you can, of course, find any uh, paper with him. So more than 750 peer review publications um, he has written in his uh, scientific life and it's a really big pleasure for me and an honor that um, we have him on the screen today with this um, presentation, with this webinar. And the second speaker is also well known, it will be um, Rudy Costas from um, the Netherlands. Um, no one believes that he's retired since 2014, he's active as he was uh, all the years before. He is uh, one of the resuscitation giants responsible for the um, registry in the area around, um, this is called arrest, uh, so Amsterdam and the regions around Amsterdam. This is one of the um, most interesting registries and then data collection systems, what we can see. And it's a pleasure to um, have two presentations, one from uh, Johan about the Swedish registry as an example and a very long ongoing registry in Europe. And then Rudolf Kostas, uh, talking about our European registry idea. And um, yeah, Johan, the floor is yours. And um, we are happy to see and listen what you present about the registry in Sweden. Thanks a lot to both speakers and thanks a lot again for the perfect organization from the colleagues from Singapore. Thank you so much, uh, Jan Torsten, for this nice introduction. So could I have my slides? Yeah, and, and the title of my presentation is How Can We Better Communicate Registry Data to Mobilize Public Support to Improve Cardiac Arrest Outcome? Next. So if you talk about strategies, uh, we think that if, if you try to reach the public with a message, there must be an idea about how such knowledge in the public will help to improve outcome. Think twice, better with the quality than quantity. Next. Uh, there are, of course, alternative ways to communicate registry data with the public uh, via CPR education in the community or via social media such as Facebook and Twitter and via press release. Next. Uh, so how to incorporate registry data into CPR education? Well, you could incorporate registry data in the background information or you may use specific web-based information about registry data before the CPR course, or you may use both alternatives. Next. Here are examples of, of uh, uh, information that we uh, give on our website when we give our yearly report from the registry. Uh, uh, CPR in Sweden is a true population movement. Five million Swedes are educated and they conform about 50% of the population. Next. Next. And we have calculated that uh, um, 15 citizens have been educated per hour in Sweden since 1983. No, no, stop, back again. Back again. 15 citizens have been educated per hour since 1983 in Sweden. Next. We have also estimated that uh, there is about one life saved every sixth hour in Sweden if we add both survivors after in hospital and out of hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, and these are simple messages uh, uh, which we think is nice to show to the public. Next. Another message. There are more than 120 national quality registries in our country, but only one of them measures the clinical performance. 
that is to say the number of lives saved each year. Next. Uh, we have uh, now followed uh, the situation in Sweden for nearly 30 years. And this is another uh, simple message. Uh, here you can see the proportion of cases with CPR started before arrival of EMS after out of hospital cardiac arrest. And you can see to the left in 1990, there were less than 40%. And now in 2019, we are up to 80%, a dramatic increase. Next. And this has resulted in, you look at the blue uh, curve, this has resulted in a dramatic decrease in the delay from collapse until start of CPR. You can see that uh, the median delay time runs down from 10 minutes in 1990 to one minute in 2019. But unfortunately, at the same time, there has been an increase, and that's a green line, there has been an increase in the delay from dispatch of, of uh, the EMS until arrival of EMS. Uh, that is to say the EMS response time, which has nearly doubled during these 30 years. Next. Um, but overall, we can also see that thanks to the efforts out in the community, uh, in combination, of course, with the work by the ambulance, there is a really dramatic increase in the number of reported saved lives annually. In green, you can see that the number of saved lives annually after out of hospital arrest has increased from 124 in 1990 up to more than 600 now in 2019. And above you see in red, the number of saved lives each year since 2006 uh, regarding survivors after in hospital cardiac arrest. So overall, there is a clear cut uh, increase in the number of reported saved lives, both outside and inside hospital. Next. An important partner uh, and an important link between the Swedish Registry of Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation and CPR education is the Swedish Resuscitation Council. So we work in collaboration, next. And uh, another important partner is the Swedish Heart and Lung Foundation. They have experience on how to communicate with the public and they uh, ha have helped us tremendously. Next. Here comes greetings from Norway. Uh, and this is a message that they uh, share with the public in Facebook, etc. You can see on top that in 2019, they had more nearly 4,000 attempted res resuscitations and 85% of these cases received by standard CPR, and 15% had an AED connected before EMS arrival. And uh, in bottom, you can see that, uh, uh, yeah, you can see that half of the patients received an ambulance within nine minutes, and, and uh, 34 cases were successfully shocked before EMS arrival and alive when EMS arrived. And in bottom, you can see that 424 people survived more than 30 days and 93% of the survivors had a good neurological outcome. Next. And here are greetings from, from Ireland. Uh, and the, here are their data from, from 2018. And on top, you can see that there were overall 2,500 cases with uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest. And then you can see that 22% uh, uh, were, uh, had an AD or were defibrillated before uh, EMS arrival. And then you can see in bottom that there were overall 176 survivors during that year. Next. So finally, let me say a few words about press release. Uh, we can use press release uh, uh, with support from news media, newspapers, radio, television, and medical newspapers. And the aim should be that we aim to create an opinion in the community, uh, which then should hopefully influence politicians. Next, I would like to show you a practical example uh, of the background to such uh, a proposed press release. Next. Uh, this is the title of a thesis which was defended a few uh, weeks back by a colleague of mine called my name Johan Holmen. Uh, and the title of the thesis was the fight against time 
in pre-hospital cardiac arrest, a true medical emergency. Next. Uh, and here we calculate, based on data from 2018, the number of saved lives in relation to EMS response time. And to the right, you can see that if the EMS response time was more than 15 minutes, then 504 lives were say, would be saved. But if we shorten the uh, EMS response time, you can see, you go to the left, that the number of lives saved per year will increase successively. And we, when you look to the left, when the EMS response time is less than seven minutes, then nearly 1,200 uh, lives would be saved. Next. Uh, so the eventual press release will run like this. In Sweden, the EMS response time after a cardiac arrest outside hospital has doubled during the last decades. 600 further lives may be saved if EMS response was the same as three decades ago. And data were received from the Swedish Registry of Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation. Next. Just estimations. To the left, you can see that in Sweden, as I said before, 600 more lives would be saved if we could shorten uh, uh, the EMS response time as suggested. If we convert these figures to Europe, and if the conditions in Europe were the same uh, as, as um, uh, in Sweden, then the number of saved lives would increase from 18,000 to 36,000, in addition with 18,000 lives. And if we made the same calculation for US, there would be an increase in the number of saved lives from 24,000 to 48,000. Next. If we add uh, these increases in Europe and U US, that would correspond to five further lives saved per hour. So in conclusion, next. Um, in the communication with the public about CPR and registry data, I think it's important that we, as had been said before, we keep it simple and that quality is more important than quantity and the message must be useful. And uh, I think personally, uh, based on previous experience, that a slogan may be helpful. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Johan, and uh, we directly hand over to Rudy. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Ruud Koster, and I'm a cardiologist at the Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam. And it's a pleasure and an honor for me to tell you briefly something about the European Registry of Cardiac Arrest, also known as Eureka. What kind of database is Eureka? Eureka is a registry of all the communities in Europe and it is inclu included and collected in the Utsein style. The scope is to include all European countries and therefore it is a multinational and multi-center uh, study. We published our first report in 2014, Eureka 1, in which the results from 27 countries or regions within that country are collected over a period of one month. We, report, we reported the second study, Eureka 2, in 2020, in which in 2017 we had included 28 countries and collected their data for three months. What kind of research can we do with Eureka? First and foremost, we try to do epidemiologic studies to identify the difference between the systems and between the countries and regions. Second, we want to assess the outcomes of those regions and countries. We therefore, and that is important, try to inform EMS on the performance of the system and compare that to other systems and therefore allow them to identify weak links in their chain of survival which makes it possible to improve them. For that, we need data that are collected locally in each country separately, and that can be 
collected and sent over to a central Eureka database in an aggregate form. But we also like to do secondary goals, do clinical research, and use the database as a generic data collection tool for that purpose. We then can add variables as needed according to the specific clinical question we like to answer. But for this, we need individual data that cannot be condensed. They must be individual data sent over to the central Eureka database, but they should be de-identified according to the regulations of the European community. We published our second study, Eureka 2, in 2020 in resuscitation. I'll share some of the results of it, but mainly to share with you our common uh, achievement and our common problems. As Jutstein stipulates, we need to start with all the patients that have a confirmed cardiac arrest by EMS. We know that certainly not all patients in which a cardiac arrest is confirmed will have CPR started. That's only a certain proportion of that, and that must be well known. And from those in which CPR is started, we know that only a certain proportion has a return of spontaneous circulation. And they are transported with circulation to the hospital, while a big proportion of those without ROSC uh, will die in, on scene, and only a smaller proportion of them will go to the hospital with ongoing CPR. While arriving at the hospital with transfer of care, hospital treatment will be started, and a certain proportion of the patients will, will survive, and that will be the final result of our study. Um, it's important to note that we are missing in our data about 24% of all the patients whom hospital treatment was started. And that means that if we claim an overall survival rate in Europe of 7.2%, there is a certain uncertainty in that because we do not know if those that are missing are an unbiased sample of the normal population or if they are biased towards better or worse outcome of them. Important to note that we know that we covered only 34% of the population of the countries we included. There is a big difference between the countries. Four countries have a full 100% coverage of their population, but it goes down to as much as low as 3% of the population. Therefore, we are not sure if the report we give really reflects the full population because that population that is covered may also be a biased selection of the total population of the country. The proportion of patients that in which incident of which CPR is started, 56 per 100,000 inhabitants, is a fairly well-known number. It matches well what we have quoted already for many years, but it's remarkable to know that between countries, that incidence has an almost fourfold vari variation. And that may be another source of potential bias because we don't understand why in some cases CPR started and in others it is not started. If you look at some of the process and outcome variables that we see, we see that bystander CPR was given in these countries in 58% of all the cases. But you also note in the bars that there is a huge variation between the countries. Each bar represents one country in the registry. And bystander CPR can vary from as low as 13% in some countries to 80% or over in other countries. Similar thing is seen at the rate of ROSC. On average, it's 33%, but also in ROSC, there is a lowest ROSC rate of 7% and a almost five-fold higher ROSC rate in other countries and everything in between. Overall survivor, survival, therefore, also reflects those big differences. The overall survival of 7.2 varies fourfold between the highest and the lowest country. Of particular interest, is the survival in the group we call the Utstein comparator. 
The understand comparator are those patients that are found in VF and that are bystander witnessed. They have, as we know, the best outcome, and it is indeed fourfold higher than the average of all the survival cases we see. But there is a huge variation between the survival in those best groups. And that is therefore also a very good uh, marker of the quality of the process within the areas that we studied. Of especially interest is to see that the amount of patients in which the Utsan comparator is true, so the amount of patients that are bystander witnessed and have VF as first rhythm, is 13% on average, but can ever can vary fourfold between the countries. And this is in particularly important because they are the ones that represent the biggest part of the survivors. Ventricular fibrillation, therefore, is an important determinant. But it is both a determinant of the outcome, but it's also a marker of the process. Because we know that ventricular fibrillation has the best prognosis. People in VF have a, about four or five-fold increase in survival compared to those with a non shockable rhythm. But at the same time, we know that the VF occurs in a time-dependent manner. It disappears by the minute. When the later we arrive to make the first recording, either from an AED or from an ambulance, that determines how much VF we will see or if it has already deteriorated in, particular, in asystole. Also, bystander CPR can help to keep ventricular fibrillation in ventricular fibrillation, so the quality and incidence of bystander CPR as well is an important determinant of the ability to record VF as first rhythm. Therefore, VF is particularly important, as well as the time to the first shock. The earlier you shock, the higher the chance of survival, and we see that about the median time to defibrillation counted from the moment of alarm of the alarm of the dispatch center is about 10, 11 minutes. And we consider that already long. Survival has declined dramatically between the collapse and the moment of, the, of 10 minutes, after 10 minutes. It's important to look at this very early shocks. Those are already given either before the ambulance service is called or so fast after that we are quite confident that these are only AED shocks. What did Eureka achieve? The success is that we are able to, to create a collaboration between 28 countries. We collected data of 179 million Europeans, which is a lot. And we did this in a well-standardized Utstein way. We analyzed and published the data already twice and we allow, therefore, a comparison between countries. The limitations are important. We have no control over the local data collection. We have missing data, especially in survival outcome, which limits the ability to draw firm conclusions. The data we collect are, may not be representative of what is true for the whole country. We have snapshots of a short period, Three months still is not sufficient to control for all spontaneous variations between the month and the yearly variations. And therefore, we are not yet able to give in-depth explanation for the difference in the process and the outcomes. What do we need to improve? First, we need to try to achieve an uninterrupted data collection, which will allow us to see trends if we change things in the way we perform CPR and perform resuscitation. It also helps to create a routine in the people who do the data collection. They will get more experience and the differences will diminish. And we need a local quality control with central oversight of that quality control. But the most important thing that helps and that was a hindrance to Eureka so far is that all the things are only possible if we have sufficient funding. And Eureka so far has been limited in its capabilities because we have limited funding 
from Eureka, from European Russia Station Council and some organizations. So with this, I want to end and I hope there will be questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Rudy, Johan, and Jan Thorsten for this um, amazing presentations uh, for the European part and uh, for Eureka. And now we are leaving Europe and uh, crossing the Atlantic Ocean and um, going to the US. And I will uh, hand over to Professor Brian McNally to introduce the speaker um, for um, the US and for CARES. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, this is Brian McNally. I'm looking forward to presenting today. Uh, Kimberly Villano uh, helped me put this presentation together. Um, I thought it'd be easiest with having one of us present. So I'm gonna talk a, lot of, a lot, little bit today about uh, CARES and some of our uh, output, specifically surveillance, uh, quality improvement aspects, as well as research, sort of these three spheres uh, of output. Um, this is our current footprint today, uh, looking at the registry. Uh, it's one, almost 28 states that we have state level coordinator. Um, uh, population footprint of around 152 million, approaching uh, half the country by population. And as you can see here, uh, there's been a significant growth each year. Uh, last year, we had over 100,000 cases. In 2019, we're expecting around 130,000 cases this year. 1,800 EMS agencies, almost 2,200 hospitals. So it's been a lot of growth. We definitely have a lot more output today uh, and data, obviously records, uh, patients um, uh, that have been entered in the registry, close to half a million uh, to date. Um, we learned a lot in the process of trying to simplify the output for the end users. Um, historically, we have EMS audience, hospital and dispatch, and we've developed reports for each. I'm gonna show you here our EMS output our standard um, unseen report, as you can see, sort of a flow chart approach. All of our end users can log in 24 seven and look at these reports uh, at their fingertips. They, they can pick a date range. Um, each year we develop a uh, annual report, usually April of the year, giving us preceding calendar year data that's been fully audited. We develop our research data set at the same time. But these reports here that you'll be seeing uh, are ones that are accessible 24 seven. We want our end users to be able to look at the data um, at their leisure. Uh, other two reports you can see on the right, call a survival report. I know it'd be a little small to see, but looking at specific situations, like for example, public setting arrests, and then looking at total number of cases, overall uh, number of patients that, that develop sustained ROS, those that survived to admission, survived discharge, CPC score. Um, so quickly you can kind of see for different situations, what is the final uh, outcome? Summary report below that is more demographic information. Um, so the combination of three reports are, are answer most questions for EMS agencies. Sometimes we'll have to develop a custom report if there's a specific request, um, but we find that these three uh, workhorse reports uh, answer most questions. Hospital data, as you can see here, specific reports on the left. We have a benchmarking report allowing a hospital to look at their data. The top is sort of in-hospital characteristics. The bottom part of the report is the pre-hospital characteristics, but specific to those patients that um, a hospital system would take care of. We have the ability to look at local hospital data. It's part of a larger system, enterprise-wide report, state level and national data. On the right, you can see, again, sort of a flow chart. Um, we took the Utsin report and um, mirrored it for cases that made it to the hospital. And then the big tease, tease out point is, those that had sustained ROSC um, or what you see on this front page, those that had non-sustained would end up in the second page. Obviously the outcomes are markedly different. We wanted to tease that out. Summary metrics in that box up in the right-hand corner. Um, and then really uh, allowing a hospital to understand as well, patients that came through the front door by EMS, 
Um, and then a separate report for those that were transferred. Uh, transfer patients typically have about a 45% survival rate. Patients that come through the front door around 15 or 16%, so almost triple the survival. And the reports have allowed us to um, help hospitals understand how they're doing for both uh, scenarios. Um, we put out our annual report right around when we um, generate uh, their national reports in April. This kind of sums up a lot of our summary metrics. Um, we also have the ability to tie in quality improvement activities, what's going on with CARES. Um, obviously, the data by itself, we realize, is, is not as valuable as the data with um, tying to uh, activities that uh, communities are actually doing um, from CPR training to uh, telephone CPR quality improvement, et cetera. Um, so it kind of sums up the work and what's going on um, nationally with the agencies that are participating. So you can see here on the right, there's some additional reports looking at sort of the trees in the forest, um, overall survival, um, uh, bystander CPR, and then unseen survival. I'm looking at each of those lines is, is an actual agency that had at least uh, 100, um, 150 arrests a year and looking at the variability. And I think that's the key point when you look at output. Um, you've got a lot of trees in the forest and some trees are very high and some trees are very low and trying to understand where are you in the forest as an agency. So providing that information back and the ability to benchmark, we think is really important for communities to not only measure as step one, but to look at their data step two and then to act on it and doing the quality improvement activities. So um, providing this information back we think is, is helpful Report here, you can see state level uh, aggregate metrics. Uh, about two years now we've had uh, voluntarily those states that have at least 50% of the state population participating in CARES to submit data. Um, I think all but one state so far has opted in that's qualified. You'll see 17 states here in the District of Columbia. Again, it gives a, a, a quick snapshot of how is the state doing in terms of what percentages of the state is, is actually covered in CARES, what's the incidence of cardiac arrest, overall survival, unseen survival, and then um, bystander interventions. Um, we find that this has been helpful in increasing transparency and allowing states to show, hey, we're doing this and um, we're participating with uh, the other states that are voluntarily reporting their data. Um, next, next module really talking about quality improvement, giving, giving some quick examples. Uh, thankfully, we've got many different examples of communities that have um, publish what they've done um, using CARES data from a quality improvement standpoint, both measurement and benchmarking activities, but providing feedback and sort of this uh, resuscitation system of care uh, and understanding the importance of having data. Um, each year when we, we uh, send out our regular reports, as I mentioned earlier, we also provide a, a measure and improve document, as you see here, and that's, there's a lot of data that we send out and so people are not uh, trying to make sure they're not overwhelmed when they're thinking of quality improvement activities. We provide for them at the agency level, what is their bystander CPR and, and what is their public access defibrillation rate um, compared to national average. We'll insert those figures in here to customize it and then provide them with a uh, hint at some of the uh, activities that they could consider uh, to do if they're not already doing. Focus on dispatcher CPR, high performance CPR, community-based uh, defibrillation. Um, uh, and then the resources available. So it's a quick two-pager to kind of help people when they're looking at the reports to remind them, hey, these are the things you might consider doing if you're not doing already to improve, um, you know, improve your survival in the community. Um, the idea at the national level, uh, there is now a curriculum called CPR Lifelinks. Uh, it's developed through NHTSA, uh, I'm sorry, through, um, uh, yeah, National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration, which is sort of the EMS agency uh, at the national level um, in Washington, D.C. The CPR Lifelinks developed a curriculum for uh, telephone CPR as, as well as what we call high-performance CPR and tying those two together. Um, both of these are considered level one recommendations by the American Heart Association. We realize probably the two best activities that any community could focus on or at least improve on if they're already doing to uh, improve overall survival. Um, as you can see here in the next slide, um, looking at data, um, there's a huge variation, as I mentioned earlier, trees in the forest effects, almost a range of 6% when we look at the higher volume CARES communities um, by center CPR rate. Um, you know, national average is about 40%. 
but uh, a huge amount of uh, variation uh, at the community level. And then we look at high performance CPR. Historically, um, there's a lot of room for opportunity for improvement when we look at guidelines. So again, tying the, using the data to make the case to say, these are the activities that we should be focusing on, we think is very important. Um, this slide here is really summarizing uh, work of Anchorage, Alaska. For those that might know, might know Mike Levy, Dr. Mike Levy, his medical director, he shared with us um, improvement activity that they performed a few years back uh, before or after effect, uh, which a lot of systems have done when they've done telephone CPR training and showing you can decrease the amount of time to rec call recognition, um, recognizing the case, of course, is cardiac arrest, but also minimizing the time from call receipt to first compression or call receipt to first instruction. Uh, CARES has a module for that and allows communities to track uh, their outcomes in a report, reporting process. Um, Delaware County um, in uh, the state of Delaware on the East Coast, uh, same idea. They use CARES telephone CPR module. You can see on the bottom, pre-intervention, they were recognizing about 76% of cases that turn out to be cardiac arrest um, on the phone. Uh, Post-intervention, about 84%. Um, time to recognition dropped significantly by more than half. Uh, it was almost, almost a, a minute and a half uh, initially to less than 50 seconds. Um, and the idea is that you know, communities, um, when they make the effort to um, make changes and they have data, they can show a before after effect and it really supports um, why this is so important to do at the community level. Um, DC Fire Department, another example community uh, quality improvement activities at the local level using CARES data. Um, they made it, uh, several changes. The new fire chief came in in 2015 and they changed their telephone CPR process around. They did community-based CPR training. They did high performance CPR training with their um, EMS providers. You can see from 2015 to 16, a big jump in the number, total number of survivors in the District of Columbia, the nation's capital from 38 survivors, absolute number of patients to 67 the following year. This is publicly reported data that they share with their mayor, fire chief at the time, uh, fire chief dean. So again, it's great to see when communities are using data and showing it with their leadership about what they're doing um, uh, for the community. Um, Chicago Fire Department, same idea. Um, they joined CARES um, back in 2013 uh, and also a program called Heart Rescue, focusing on quality improvement activities. Um, they changed their protocol for cardiac arrest to staying on the scene longer, focusing on high performance CPR. You can see the training group here, they trained uh, close to 4,500 providers. It took over a year and a half to train all their providers um, and focused on also changing their telephone CPR process and had a fourfold increase in survival. Um, you might not be able to see it here, but they published this um, and really showing, um, you know, you can make a difference, particularly in a very large urban EMS system um, they made a concerted effort to not only measure, but to do comprehensive quality improvement and training, um, and then track it over time to show that there was benefit. Um, at the local level, we've seen other communities like Vail and Beaver Creek uh, ski resorts that have focused on a call push shock approach uh, a program called Starting Hearts. They partner with their ski patrol and put ADs in strategic places. And the idea that um, they have at the local level, they have outcome data to understand what their bystander CPR rate is, what their public defibrillation rate is. So when they make a change, they can see whether there's a before or after effect. Hospitals obviously have been involved uh, as well as uh, um, EMS agencies and quality improvement activities. In short, this was a uh, Metro Health uh, hospital system um, in Michigan that noticed that their in-hospital mortality as measured by CARES was higher than national average. They focused on uh, patients that came in post-arrest uh, getting those they felt that needs to go to the cath lab to the cath lab by following an uh, dedic, um, algorithmic approach that's been published and showed um, uh, versus those that may want to go directly to the ICU for targeted temperature management and showed a before after effect when they did these um, uh, educational um, training sessions and quality improvement activities that um, their survival uh, changed um, during that, that study interval. Um, state level activities as well, focusing on community-based CPR in Michigan um, and what we call resuscitation academies. From our colleagues out in Seattle, King County, they've had a training program in place for a while and that resuscitation academy has been on a, a now roadshow. Multiple states have had um, resuscitation academies 
and allowing for um, teaching local EMS agencies how to do quality improvement around cardiac arrest and learning from others that have been in that place for close to 30 years. Um, but the idea is um, communities like Michigan have done resuscitation academies, have also done local CPR training initiatives. Um, and finally, I'm gonna talk about the last uh, research, uh, a lot of research that's come out of CARES, uh, a lot of uh, pr um, study proposals underway. There's a more recent study proposal, proposal looking at disability adjusted life years. Um, and recognizing that uh, cardiac arrest um, compared to was number three uh, at the national level in the US, only behind a heart disease and low back pain. Um, so a pretty significant number of patients are impacted by this condition, but obviously not as much funding research as we would hope would be uh, in that space, uh, given the, the morbidity and mortality associated with um, at a hospital cardiac arrest. Some more recent data I wanted to share just as an example Without going uh, too deep into this, uh, we've, uh, as I'm sure a lot of other communities are going to look at um, uh, the effect of COVID on resuscitation practice. We've seen significant changes uh, happen at the national level as well as the local level. This is looking at county-based data. Uh, we matched county-based data and CARES for agencies that were participating last year as well as this year that we had complete data for um, and matched uh, COVID mortality. So as you can see on the left, it's COVID mortality per uh, million, uh, number of cases per million increased, you could see that uh, overall sustained ROS decreased. Um, overall ROS dropped uh, from last year from almost 30% to 23% in the study period. Um, and again, this is looking during the pandemic period, which we define as mid-March to end of April. Um, but as you see the COVID mortality case rate increase at the county level, you can see a much greater drop um, almost down to 17%. Um, same data set looking at um, the, again, COVID mortality at the county level, looking at the termination resuscitation rate. We saw a huge jump. Um, you know, uh, last year was almost 40%, this year 53.9% during the pandemic period. But again, a much greater influence on the higher impacted communities. So you can see that communities that had over 500 cases per million had almost an 80% um, term, 80% um, increase in um, the ROSC rate, I'm, I'm sorry, in the, in the termination resuscitation rate. And then overall um, incidence of cardiac arrest, we suspected might go up. Uh, what we found in the data was interesting, which it, it did go up across the board, but not so much in those communities that did not have significant COVID impact um, compared with those that had much greater impact. So overall, uh, our impressions were with this study that the COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically eroded recent survival gains uh, for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in the US. And even in communities with low COVID-19 mortality, which did not experience a meaningful increase in out-of-hospital in incidents. So you know, even communities that were not overwhelmed, there seemed to be um, decrease in ROSC as well as an increase in TOR. Uh, likely protocol changes uh, were, were responsible for that. Um, wanted to share real quickly, a lot of other projects going on nationally whole list here, we're, we're happy to share the slides. Um, you know, other studies looking at COVID, looking at um, relationship with um, gender uh, and sex with cardiac arrest characteristics, um, uh, looking at uh, several other um, several other adult as well as pediatric topics. Um, state level, we have multiple uh, projects going on in the states you see listed here and more that are coming in. So a lot of activities, typically we have 25 to 35 projects a year that are active um, and including wanted to highlight three NIH funded studies using CARES, University of Michigan, looking at quality assessment of high performing versus low performing agencies in the state of Michigan that are blinded and trying to tease out what are those qualities um, that seem to be most prevalent in a, a high performing system and develop a play, playbook for other communities to learn from. Duke University uh, just got a $14 million NIH grant to use CARES to track quality improvement efforts uh, at a state level that'll go on over the next seven years. Um, so we're very excited about that. Mount Sinai School of Medicine uh, using CARES data linking with Medicare um, uh, records uh, to do machine, machine learning modeling. Um, so I'll end there and look forward to questions um, later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian, for uh, the presentation of uh, this really impressive numbers. 
Um, I think there are a lot of interesting research projects going um, ongoing and um, to come. Yeah, but now we are heading back a little bit east and uh, going back uh, to Asia. And I wanted to invite uh, Professor Marcus Ong to introduce your, um, his speakers for Paris. Thanks, Ian. Um, my pleasure to introduce our two speakers from Asia. And the first is uh, Professor Hideharu Tanaka, MD, PhD. He is Professor and Director of uh, EMS Systems at the Graduate School of Kokushikan University. And he is also President-Elect of the All Japan Paramedic Education Association, Committee Member of the uh, Japan National Resuscitation Council, a PAD Council of the Ministry of Health, Welfare and Labor, and Board Member of the Japan Emergency Medical Society. And our second speaker will be uh, Associate Professor Kyung Jun Song, who is uh, Head of Department at Boromay Emergency Medicine, Seoul National University Hospital. And he's also one of our ex executive uh, committee members for the Pan-Asian Resuscitation Outcome Study. So without further ado, we all look forward to hearing these two great talks. Thank you, Marcus, and good evening and uh, good morning, everyone. And my name is Tanaka from Tokyo, Japan, and uh, I'm great pleasure to talking today. I uh, want to talk uh, today and a little bit about the Japan Bustain Registry and how Japan use it and improve OHC outcome. As you know, and Japan uh, Utstein Registry has been started in uh, 2004, and all seven or five fire departments cooperate all the OHC data input by paramedic. Until now, more than uh, 130,000 OHC cases has been recorded every year, totaling over 1.5 million OHC cases registered in 2018. And Japan is the only country and with over uh, 100 million population and uh, register all of OHC cases in the single nationwide systems. There are more than 200 research papers has been published. And uh, FDMA is a, a main drive uh, for OHC uh, Woodstein Registry collection, data collection. And uh, they're doing emergency uh, transportation of the patient with the uh, OHCA and online system. And it is possible to evaluate major for improving emergency service for so far as uh, objective values. And all OHCA case and data are input by FD fire department paramedic and Basically, the, those, those data is brushed up by a uh, data manager on each fire department and more than 700 fire departments in nationwide Japan. And also, uh, second uh, brush up doing a fire FDMA working, uh, uh, working group. And finally, FDMA release annually OHCA patient data for authorized registered researcher without any payment. This data should be returned to the taxpayer. And then in the beginning stage, do it here. And uh, this is a, a schema and the evidence procedure are provided by a medical society. And uh, those clinical results, uh, data collection by paramedic. And and also Utstein data feedback uh, return to uh, uh, by analysis by a researcher. And then those are a uh, trend of OHC outcome and EMS scope of practice and yearly trend. In two, uh, one, 1991, our paramedic system has been started that uh, uh, one month survival rate with sudden cardiac arrest is only 4.1%. 
after 10 years, there are gradually increase. And after 2000, shock uh, driver by uh, fire department first responder improving uh, dramatically. And also uh, tracheal intubation or adrenaline IV drug has been started in 2004 and 2006. So uh, those are uh, several component and showing and uh, improving uh, outcome. But and uh, around 2005, and that's uh, OHC registry has been started. And those are uh, second, uh, uh, I think that's a factor of the improving. And uh, I'm a little bit explaining about the 10 step improving OHC survival. And we, I divided uh, mainly three step. And step one is a, a, a lay person level target. And including uh, use of the CPR or AD and uh, public, public access defibrillation and also fast responder program. And second step for the, all the fire department EMT and third step is a community and nation level. So in the first step, and uh, we have improving uh, PAD and number of PAD and outcome. As you know that, that we have uh, more than 700,000 uh, uh, nationwide public access AD in uh, disseminate. So uh, after to disseminate, starting disseminate of AD, AD and uh, at uh, CPC one, two at one month after shock uh, improving. Uh, showing red line. And uh, as you see in the beginning, uh, they are uh, very low, but now it's uh, become to the uh, almost 16% uh, uh, of the uh, CPC 1, 2 at one month. And uh, uh, this is uh, another uh, picture and uh, all the uh, uh, survival rate, CPC 1 at one month showing in each prefecture level. In 2005, you can see, and uh, uh, there are several uh, uh, variation in by uh, uh, our uh, prefecture level. But in 2014, almost that is a tripling, tripling of the survival rate uh, in 2014, and highest is a 20 percent of the CPC 1 2. So uh, as you see that, and uh, uh, those are uh, uh, published by uh, uh, New England Journal of Medicine in uh, 2016. But uh, as you see that in slide, and this is showing the initial ECG rhythm on EMS arrival after PAD shock table. And you can see, and only 30.2% uh, become to loss. However, 30% uh, is keep BF and 80.7% and PA and 19.8 is AC store, become to AC store. If you, I would say that if you are success PAD, but still you need to paramedic on scene because there are a lot of the uh, PA and AC store after that. And uh, here is a, a community and school CPR training uh, late. And uh, since we are starting the school CPR or community CPR training in nine, 1994, in that time, uh, bystander CPR rate is only 30.4 and witness cardiac arrest. However, and that, that number is become uh, gradually increased Blue bar showing the, the number of the uh, community CPR training by fire department personnel. And the green bar showing uh, new school CPR training for uh, school, school kids. And then that's uh, the uh, biggest uh, uh, driving force right now. And uh, there are, uh, now it's almost 50% uh, of the cardiac arrest uh, received by standard CPR. And here again, in uh, uh, Nakahara uh, published in 2015, and the uh, bystander CPR uh, higher odds ratio 1.52 and compared to no CPR, and bystander defibrillation uh, versus no defibrillation with high, uh, highest on the uh, odds ratio. And bystander defibrillation is much higher than EMS defibrillation. 
So uh, those kind of the, uh, you know, basic uh, CPR training, community CPR training become to the uh, successfully done. And second step is the EMS uh, rebel. And as you see, and dispatch justice CPR, uh, since 2005, we have been start uh, improving of the each uh, fire department. As I talked to the today, and we have a 700 fire department. Each fire have a uh, each uh, dispatch center, and and that is not a single uh, very uh, difficult to uh, improving whole nationwide. But uh, we are uh, try to do, and since 2005, and then the result are showing here. And uh, this paper recently published ourselves. And since uh, 2005, and as you see, uh, uh, orange uh, bar showing dispatch induced by standard CPR ratio. And uh, in the 2005 and 2015, that's almost uh, 900 times uh, increasing of the rate. But as you see that to the uh, right side and and uh, uh, chest compression only in CPR. Uh, now is major uh, uh, bystander CPR type of that. And uh, uh, conventional CPR and then uh, chest compression the CPR is an almost identical uh, result. So uh, here again, and the same thing in the Iwami uh, uh, reported in the 2015, uh, dissemination chest compression only uh, CPR, uh, survivor of the out of uh, OHCA. And you can see the, the uh, uh, down uh, karam in uh, chest compression, the CPR, uh, CPC12 showing uh, higher odds ratio and also, also identical of the conventional CPR. So now we are uh, uh, doing a new training program for emergency medical dispatch. It's uh, this, uh, including four days uh, training for EMD, uh, EMD training. We have no uh, EMD training before, but uh, in, since 2016, we've we, we been start and then now it's a, uh, a way of the improving. And uh, step three is a near report and uh, step three, uh, other uh, step is uh, to EMS and uh, uh, including uh, the uh, ARS of the uh, ARS of the uh, EMS. So you can see this data and uh, IB, uh, pre donating and advanced airway. If we doing a, a single uh, uh, analysis and it not look, seems to be it's not uh, uh, non-effective, but we uh, uh, try to do uh, uh, change of the uh, trend of the adrenaline and 2000 adrenaline has been start 2006 and it's uh, become gradually uh, number of the adrenaline administration is increased. And then we have uh, reached of the adrenaline have a limited uh, uh, of the effect. Since uh, we uh, analyze of the time uh, data from the, the uh, patient contact to the adrenaline administration. And then this showing here and um, almost eight minutes within uh, nine minutes of the after patient contact uh, adrenaline administration is effective. And then those are same data. Area epinephrine uh, administration shows uh, uh, higher uh, CPC one two rate of the late epinephrine date. So same thing, and uh, we compare to the uh, intubation, uh, intratracheal intubation, with a shock cover group, and you can see an early uh, uh, intubation group are showing higher uh, risk and CPC one two rate uh, compared to the late in shock cover group. Also. Uh, same results showing the non shockable group too. So, and uh, we have reached the, those two uh, procedures, intubation or IV drug, adrenaline, uh, should be start in within uh, 10 minutes and almost seven minutes. So that'd be a, a very uh, favorable uh, result become. 
So uh, uh, this is the last uh, few slides. And uh, 10 step improving and cardiac arrest survival. Now it's a step three. Uh, we, I think we have successfully done in the annual report of the community, but still we have a, a culture of excellence and we have to try to do that. And then, sorry that is all the Japanese uh, uh, data, but uh, you can see any uh, people can see uh, each fire department and also nationwide data uh, uh, result uh, showing uh, in a website in the FDMA. So uh, I think that is a, a kind of that is a try. Uh, now it's a become to the successfully done. And uh, in conclusion, my uh, presentation uh, in Japan with the introduction of the Stein statistical analysis and PAD has been started 2005. More than uh, 750 AD and uh, over uh, 200 nationwide uh, OHC, uh, uh, 200 nationwide uh, OHCA patients successfully disseminate. So therefore, uh, during the last 15 years, dramatically increased OHC survival rate with uh, not only PAD, also uh, bystander CPL, dispatch CPL, high performance CPL, and EMS performance, uh, ARS uh, procedure, and community and nationwide effort of the cultures of excellence. And it keep remembered that each medical person effort for the OHC outcome improvement by the individual healthcare professions. We will change the nationwide system. Thank you so much for your attention. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm KJ Song from South Korea. Uh, it's my great honor to participate in this great uh, virtual conference. Uh, I'm an emergency physician and working with Korean CDC about uh, our national cardiac arrest registry. So today I'll talk about our registry and their use. First of all, I want to tell you I have no conflict of interest and the Korean uh, out of hospital cardiologist data which were collected by Korean CDC were used in this presentation. Uh, this is today's topic and I will explain about Korean cardiologist registry and key digital to be. Uh, and in the last part, uh, I'll talk about effort we are making to improve our cardiac arrest uh, clinical result. Uh, Korean out of hospital cardiac arrest registry is uh, EMS based. Uh, cardiac arrest patients are collected from uh, EMS run seat and our medical record reviewers fill up the needed hospital data uh, from hospital medical record. This is our history. Uh, actually, Korean out-of-hospital cardiac arrest registry was developed according to uh, time flow and companion project. In early period, we had a CABAS project, cardiovascular disease surveillance project, and data source was simple, EMS run sheet and hospital medical record. From 2011, we had a separate EMS CPR registry and we had a dispatch CPR registry. From uh, four to five years before, uh, we started two tier response system and uh, we had uh, related data also. This slide shows uh, data processing and feedback process of our registry. This is the main result of our registry. We have about uh, 30,000 uh, cases per year, and we have about 
uh, 40 cardiac arrest standardized cases per 1 million people per year. Our survival to discharge rate and good CPC rate will improve uh, this direction. And in 2018, we have 8.6% survival discharge rate and 5.1% uh, good CPC rate nationally. And uh, if you look at uh, this confining it to the definition of Ustine, uh, survival to discharge rate is 61.6% uh, and good CPC rate is 52.2% in uh, 2018. And uh, we can see this result by each region. This is an uh, important finding because there are a huge gap between best survival rate area to worst uh, survival rate area. Our government can show this to people and can push the local government about their effort to uh, good survival away from cardiac arrest. And people can also evaluate the effort of their local region. Uh, there are also huge gap in uh, good CPC result uh, by region. Seoul uh, have best result and Gyeongbuk uh, have all worst result. As you know, uh, we are doing Austin 10-step implementation strategy program now. Uh, I want to tell you the important effort among these things. We have launched uh, Dispatcher CPR program from 2011. After that, we had jumping up result about bystander CPR rate and uh, survival rate. And we had multi-tier response system from 2015. We have uh, ambulance, ambulance response about uh, 50 per percent and ambulance fire engine response about six to seven percent. And we had a net CPR program. This is a pilot text message alarming project about cardiac arrest. Uh, we call it a neighborhood access deflation and cardiopulmonary resuscitation program, net CPR. With this program, uh, the main outcome was improved. You can uh, see here. And with our registry, Korean CDC, uh, uh, publishing cardiac arrest statistics every year from 2006. As you can see this diagram. Uh, many people can easily understand about our uh, cardiac arrest result and the importance of bystander CPR, uh, something like that. Uh, this is a uh, newspaper and the broadcast about uh, cardiac arrest result and uh, they can emphasize uh, the things that we must uh, doing our effort uh, to improve our cardiac arrest result. Mm, this is a, a longitudinal trend of outcomes in cardiac arrest result in Korea. Uh, you can see the improved uh, result. I want to say three C uh, are important for improvement of our result. Uh, cooperation, collaboration, and coordination. Uh, we want to improve uh, our result more and more. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Uh, so Thank you, I just Nathan. wanted to add a comment, if you, if I may, about uh, you know the two presentations that we had, and uh, I had the privilege of uh, actually attending one of the press conferences that uh, uh, they had in Korea, in Seoul, uh, during the launch of their annual kind of uh, cardiac arrest registry results. 
and it was uh, very eagerly attended by all the press reporters and actually appeared uh, in the newspapers. I think, if I'm not wrong, front page of the song. Um, and, uh, you know, gets a lot of national attention in Korea. And similarly, uh, in our partners in Taiwan, for example, uh, they have uh, tabloids that were actually published, which is the safest city in Taiwan to have a cardiac arrest. And the mayor will either be re-elected or can be uh, uh, voted out based on those results. So uh, just some background for the rest of you that you might find interesting. Thank you very much, Professor Taraka and Professor Song, for these very, very interesting presentations and for the impressive numbers. And yeah, we are done with the presentations and uh, with the talks, and we can open the Q&A session. And I've seen that there are already some uh, questions are posted in the um, Q&A chat box. Please feel free to place your questions in the Q&A chat box. And Professor Karen Smith will now moderate the Q&A session. Karen. Okay, thank you. So bear with me because I'm doing this on my phone. Um, so, uh, okay, so, okay, so we've got um, a question for Johan. Um, why was the response time of ambulance doubled from 1990 to 2020 in Sweden? I think there are, um, thanks for this question, uh, a number of factors, I think. Uh, the number of uh, missions, the number of calls to, to the ambulance in Sweden has increased over years uh, quite dramatically. Uh, for example, we, we made a a campaign in the 80s, which we called Heart Pain 90,000. And I, I feel quite convinced that the number of cases with chest pain have increased after that successively. Uh, we know today that among chest pain calls, just a very low proportion have myocardial infarction. And that was not the case 20 years back. So an increased burden is one reason. Then we use the ambulance today much more for various um, uh, type of works. They, today, they, the ambulance crew have to follow the patient after hospital admission. If they come with ST elevation myocardial, myocardial infarction, they don't leave them in hospital. They follow them up to the, the cath lab. And that takes time. And oh. we have a number of such, uh, um, what we call a uh, qu quick, where, where we um, uh, follow the patient, uh, or for example, uh, if they have a stroke, they are followed by the EMS crew up to, to the X-ray uh, oh. uh, for, for the brain and uh, hip fractures, uh, they follow them up to the X-ray of the hip and so forth. So an increased burden on the ambulance crew is I think one, one reason, uh, a very important reason. Then, of course, we have increased traffic and these sort of things. So I think it's a combination of things. But I remember that when we met in Singapore, we talked about this, and I got the impression that uh, from various parts of the world, you have an experience of a prolonged EMS response time. I don't think we are the only country who have this experience. No, exactly. I think it's very common. I think uh, most ambulance services worldwide would so that demand is growing faster than population growth. So there's multiple factors at play. Um, and we've certainly looked at it and it's not the aging population, which everyone um, likes to attribute it to, but it's much more complex. So excellent. And I remember there were there was a question for Rudy around the, um, or it might be for Jan Thorsten around the Eureka data. So um, do you think it's more important to improve data collection on a local level or to be able to analyze it um, from a European sort of global perspective? Yeah, thank you, Karen, for that oh. question. As uh, we learned today, Eureka is a, a combination of 28 registries, so we can do both. Uh, we have a lot of uh, efforts in every country, so every registry is uh, producing their own data, their own out output, 
And uh, for the Eureka project, we are able to um, collect the data for some um, time periods, not online, not ongoing, not um, on daily base. Um, but uh, um, to be honest, we can, at the moment, we can do really both hotspots with uh, uh, screenshots with uh, Eureka and uh, ongoing projects and analyzers within every country. So the answer is we can do both. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Can, I, can I add something to it? I think that the data collection per country on itself is just a tool and the tool of understanding. And if we improve the data collection on that local level, the tool becomes better and therefore better useful. So that's why I think that we should still make sure that the data collection is reliable and good. But the interesting thing about the level on the European level is you can use it to, to um, stimulate a country and the leadership within that country yeah. to, to, to be better than the, than the average. We have seen, I think that we show and seen that in the CARES data, and it's a well-known thing, you can, you can place your own ranking into an maybe anonymous total list and therefore tell you're good, you're bad, you can do much better than the average. It can help. Um, it's, it's made me, it's shaming, but not blaming. Mm, exactly. That's why yeah, I think you should powerful. try to do both. Excellent. Uh, and then there's been a few comments or questions, I think for probably open to the to all the speakers around the sort of devastating impact that we're seeing from COVID. Um, in some countries, um, you know, increased deaths due to COVID or um, in, in our region, not so much increased arrests due to COVID, but the system of care has slowed down. And so um, increased deaths as a consequence of delays in care. So how, how do people think that we're going to, um, to sort of try and rise above this and, and get our survival rates back post COVID? Anyone? Marcus, I'm sure you'll have ideas. Okay, uh, don't get me started though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who have heard me talk about COVID, you know, um, I've repeated one of the quotes from our foreign minister, which is, you know, COVID is a test of three things. One is our healthcare system. Two is the quality of leadership. And then three is basically the kind of uh, public support and rapport that, uh, you know, you have, you can rally around it. And I think all three are needed uh, in order to fight COVID and all three are needed you know, to maintain or continue to improve in terms of our cardiac arrest management. And I think it's difficult to divorce one from the other. Um, so I think while we are very, very much still in the front lines fighting with COVID, you know, we still have to keep up the quality of our care and make sure that, uh, you know, there's no excess mortality if we can help it and that we continue to con uh, deliver good outcomes for our patients. Uh, so I can only speak to our experience in Singapore, uh, and we were impacted as well, um, much like re the rest of you, in terms of our response times uh, increasing, especially because of the requirements for putting on additional PPE and uh, additional load from having to transport suspected cases, you know, for screening and testing. Um, we also had a decline of about 10 to 15 percent in bystander CPR rates. And unfortunately, we had to actually stop uh, activating our volunteer first responders using our app for a, a period of time, about one to two months. But uh, in recent uh, months, basically, we have restarted all of these things. And I think the good thing is um, the whole population now is masked. So if you, the law in Singapore now is if you go out in public, uh, you have to wear a, a face mask. And so if there's a bystander, a bystander who is doing CPR and we are giving telephone instructions, that bystander will be wearing a mask. And the victim who has collapsed is also wearing a mask on their face. And so I think with uh, delivery of chest compression only instructions, uh, you know, our consensus is, is pretty safe to actually uh, continue to encourage people to start chest compressions and even activate volunteers uh, to go to the scene and assist with defibrillation and chest compressions. So that's uh, one aspect of it. And we are also looking at uh, providing 
kind of uh, 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 bystander kits, you know, that will be placed with the public access defibrillators that have hand sanitizers, you know, a, a change of mask for you, and um, basically some, you know, uh, uh, some some instructions or, or uh, some uh, uh, assistance for the volunteer first responders. At the EMS level, we are actually looking at uh, stepping down a lot of our uh, excessive kind of PPE requirements. For example, uh, we have we do not require our EMS providers to wear the bunny suits, you know, the Tyvex and all that. Uh, we pretty much just go with uh, N95 uh, plus disposable gowns. And currently, there are no zero community cases uh, transmission for the last week, you know, one or two at, at most. And so we are actually looking at uh, stepping down a lot of the, the PPE requirements, which will help you know, response times and also the, the comfort of our responders. And then at the hospital level, I think it's been helpful that we've been able to protect our health system so that there are still ICU beds available. The emergency department is still functioning well. And so I think uh, we can actually provide that post resuscitation care. So I think this is part of our kind of overall strategy. Uh, happy to hear what the rest uh, think. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. We, I mean, we're similar. We've just restarted our Good Sam first responders in rural areas where um, incidence rates are very low. But yeah, pretty pretty complex. Um, I'm not sure if anyone wants to speak from the European or American perspective. But in the US, not everyone's wearing a mask. That presents a challenge. Um, you know, I think we all realize. Uh, you know. We've not seen it come up in bystander CPR, but as Marcus mentioned, you know, the guidelines changing to put a mask over the patient's mouth while you're doing compressions. Um, having a mask on yourself, you know, makes it a lot easier to uh, hopefully encourage people to do activities uh, in public. We've seen the drop uh, in public access to fibrillation uh, during the pandemic period come back. I think what we don't know is the prolonged effect. We all looked at the early data that we had in the spring. The question I think we're, we're, we're considering is, you know, what's gone on over the summer and now we're seeing an uptick in cases again here, you know, as things get colder. Um, so we're not gonna have complete data until, you know, until early spring, but looking at the trend, it looks like the bison interventions um, are happening in the home uh, they're happening outside the home, but not as much defibrillation, but trying to encourage, um, you know, communities to look at their data and try to understand how can they, um, you know, what's affecting the ROS rate. I, I think that's what we're scratching our heads about is, is it a change in practice? Is it delay getting to the patient's side that we're not capturing um, and trying to better understand it? Because clearly we've seen that effect even as, even in uh, communities that have not had a high COVID mortality. Um, we've seen change in resuscitation practice, trying to understand it better. I don't think we fully know what's going on. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're certainly um, hoping to look at our um, CPR data with our registry to see if um, CPR metrics have changed uh, with sort of PPE and, um, and other things. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone from Europe wanted to say anything about that. Otherwise, I'll move on to other things. Okay, so there was a question for Bridget with your, I loved Bridget, your um, concept of um, sort of using the findings and then coming up with a recommendation um, about sort of how to address that. And one of the questions from the audience was, do you involve the, the public or patients when you're formulating these recommendations? Yeah, thanks, Karen. Um, we absolutely have public and patient involvement. Um, at our clinical governance level. So they're actively involved in developing those recommendations. And I think not only in developing the recommendations, but um, in terms of actually utilizing the ambulance data. So we involve um, particularly cultural consultation and cultural advisors right through the whole process of data collection and um, looking at outcomes, um, particularly to think about health equity in that space. But we could absolutely do a whole lot more. Uh, yeah, we, we sort of are, are starting in that space and we could do heaps more than what we are doing currently. Yeah, excellent. I'd be really interested to chat in more detail about how you're doing that. 
because uh, I think New Zealand really lead the way in a lot of that in a lot of that work. Um, and also, <clears throat> well done to Bridget for still being awake at almost two in the morning. I think New Zealand time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Karen. <laughs> and now, just to check if Jocasta's awake, <laughs> um, there was a question for you, Jocasta, around what do you think the best types of sort of media are to use to um, to get the message out to the public. Yeah, so I think that um, the social media channels are possibly the best way to go because uh, everybody has access to social media these days and um, all of the news channels and the radio stations and all that also have um, Facebook pages and Twitter accounts and all that sort of thing. So I think it's the best way to get um, the broad messages and the most important messages out there um, with little snippets um, on the social media. I think that's the best. Yeah. Excellent. All right, let me just uh, go back into my um, questions. Um, someone is asking, is quality of survival categorised in any way? Um, but I'm not sure which registry they're referring to there. I know from a um, Victorian perspective, we do a 12-month quality of life follow-up for all our adult survivors. Okay, someone's asked, um, measuring time from cardiac arrest to call to the EMS is important but challenging. Guidance from experienced panellists would be helpful. Oh, that is really hard. Um, so I'll I, let someone else answer that. <laughs> I can say Brilliant. from the U.S. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I agree. It's very challenging. I can tell you when we look at U.S. data, the data that's most important is measuring that locally because often it's not uniform how people start and stop the clock. So when you start aggregating, you, you may not be telling the, an accurate story. However, when you know when you're starting the clock, you know what those metrics mean at the local level. Uh, very important um, and you know it, we've seen some systems where they have metrics and then they dig deeper and find out actually it's not 12 minutes for them to get the bedside it's more like 15 minutes because they weren't measuring the part of the call they don't have access to um, some systems are very multi-jurisdictional meaning the call goes touches many departments gathering that data having uniform synchronization of an atomic clock etc it gets very tricky, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't be looking at it. And the local data is probably best understood because you know what your metrics are more likely. So I think it's just challenging when people talk about aggregating data. Um, and arguably time is the most important element in cardiac arrest, but keeps you humble that often the most challenging to accurately measure it. But you should continue to try to focus on looking at your local data and, and understanding, looking at the outliers. If a call is oh. taking 20 minutes, what happened, you know, uh, if a call went very well, you know, looking at that as well. Um, so that, that's our mantra. We don't require times because some systems politically or logistically, they can't capture the data. However, um, you know, about two thirds of the agencies do contribute times and locally it's where it's most impactful. So I just say, keep looking at your own times. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, we're, um, we only have one, um, communication authority that does all of our triple um, zero call taking and we have integrated um, call taking measures into our cardiac arrest registry now for the last couple of years but um, it's so nuanced like even just engaging with our uh, call taking entity to sort of understand their interpretation of say when an arrest is recognized or when chest compression started um, can be quite different so it's, it's actually quite complex even even at the local level um yeah so good question so i've been told we've only got a few minutes left so i could either take some more questions or whether the panelists want to run, um have a whip around and sort of give if they've got like you know if you had one piece of advice to give <laughs> to give people in registries what would it be so maybe i'll maybe i'll go with that so seeing as i can see you brian i'll start with you uh, take home message. Uh, it's great that this call was put together. I think, uh, you know, in the age of COVID, it's, you know, we're further apart, but we're also more connected. And I think continuing to have dialogue 
with this group and, and the participation of uh, uh, a lot of folks across the world is great. I think there's a lot to learn from each other and um, I, I look forward to our continued discussions. Thanks for putting this together and thanks a lot to the organizers, uh, both in Europe and in Singapore. Yeah, fantastic job. It's very challenging to organize these um, sort of virtual conferences. So um, uh, uh, Professor Tanaka in um, Japan, have you got any words of wisdom for the, for the crowd? Um, okay, so uh, I would say that to the take home message for everyone and well, uh, it is difficult time to the uh, car cardiac arrest survival because uh, uh, as they, our, our colleagues uh, 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 discuss about that and and uh, so uh, based on the CPR rate is the uh, decrease and right now so but we will still uh, keep doing uh, training uh, course uh, in the COVID time. So I hope uh, not only uh, EMS uh, personnel, uh, also uh, uh, some uh, school guy or school kids and uh, all the community will uh, supporting of the uh, uh, cardiac arrest survival. So I hope uh, doing uh, everyone in Japan. Excellent. Yes, tenacity. That's the yeah. being tenacious. Uh, anyone from Europe like to say anything? I think it was a great two hour session and I'm really happy about more than 300 participants that joined this. And I think this uh, strengthens the idea of registries are not only paperwork, they are um, necessary to know more about real life. And uh, I'm really happy to learn. And this was the idea at the beginning with this group. I really love to learn from each other. And I think this was two hour training and learning session for anyone on the world. And so thanks again to the colleagues from Singapore for uh, organizing all of this uh, technical things. And also thank you to all the participants and uh, speakers that they made it uh, achievable. Thank you. Excellent. Um, um, Rudy, did you want to say something? No. Jocasta, any words of wisdom? We yeah, are. I think this is, sorry. Oh, this go. You can go, Rudy, go ahead. No, no, I was just asking who you're asking. So it's asking you. <laughs> <laughs> I was asking you. <laughs> Okay, Jakarta. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I think that um, this has been a brilliant session um, and uh, um, it's really uh, an honor to be able to see all these really um, important people in this space. And uh, it is a learning, learning tool for me and um, I've really appreciated it. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, I think there is so much that we can all learn from each other. And it's it's just great that we've we've established this sort of group with no name. Um, and we're all sort of, um, you know, willing to collaborate and share ideas and talk about the challenges and, and also the, the sort of wins that we've managed to achieve. So um, I guess I'll hand over to Jan to um, close the ceremony. <laughs> Do we have a closing <laughs> ceremony? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you for leading the Q&A session. I see Jan Torsten already has a coffee. It's uh, three o'clock in, um, in Germany in the moment. I think for you, it's quite late for a coffee. Yeah, thank you to all participants um, for participating. This, I think, really good session to, for some of you, very unconvenient um, time of the day. Um, we will place now a link into, in the chat box uh, for a short feedback survey. Please give us feedback and uh, give us honest feedback on this session. And we already see some uh, comments in the chat box. Thank you very much for this. And I also wanted to announce another session organized by this group we discussed yesterday in early next year, most likely January. 
And then more focusing a little bit on the topic of um, statistics and regulatory output. So thank you very much again and have a good day in Australia. Have a good night <laughs> and hope to see you soon and stay safe. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks everyone.